Hello class, this lecture is on Unit 1, Ecology, and Standard 4, it's about communities. So the last lecture we did was about populations. If you remember, populations is a, um, a group of the same species in the same area. Communities is going to be a whole bunch of different species living in the same area. So I'll give you a packet um, with blanks, I'm going to go over what some of these terms mean. As you should know, in this ecology section, not much of it is um, we're not learning about processes or stuff that's hard to understand. It's all just a lot of vocabulary. So I hope you guys understand what these words mean. Um, first of all, um, as I mentioned, a community is a group of populations of different species living close enough to interact. So here's an example. Here's a picture of a community. You see a zebra. I know it's, 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 it's dead, so don't look away. Um, we got a lion. Um, we've got different species all in the same area that they interact. When you have a community, there's different types of interactions between species. They can be either positive, negative, or neutral, plus, minus, or zero. Competition is what they call negative, negative, meaning it hurts um, both species or both animals. So competition is negative, negative. It hurts both. Predation, which is a noun for you know like a predator, it's good for the predator, but it's negative for the prey. So that's um, an example of an interaction that's positive and negative. Herbivore is the same thing for a animal that eats plants. It's good, but for that plant, it's negative. And then we have symbiosis, which we'll talk about very quickly, what it means. And then we also have facilitation, where facilitation, it's good for both species, or it's neutral for one, and it's good for another. So here are some examples of the symbiosis, or the things that we're talking about. So symbiosis um, has three different types. One's called parasitism, mutualism, and commensalism. Parasitism means like a parasite. So if you think of a parasite like a tick or a leech, the parasite gets nourishment from somebody else or a mosquito, and the host is harmed. So that's positive negative. Positive positive means that they're both benefiting. So I'll give you some examples like um, a moss and a tree. A moss gets a place to live, and the tree actually gets nutrients from moss. So that's an example of a relationship where they both um, benefit. And the last one is commensalism, where one benefits and the other is unaffected by it. So um, you could think of some of the animals like, kind of like parasites, where, uh, or like a bird that sits on top of a zebra, like it gets a place to say the zebra doesn't get bothered at all. So that's called commensalism. And then we also talked about facilitation. So a couple more vocab words you need to know. There's interspecific competition. Interspecific means the resources are in short supply, meaning that um, there's a limited amount of say food or air or um, shelter and they have to compete for it. That's negative negative. Competitive exclusion means two species cannot, uh, this principle means that two species cannot coexist in the community if their niches are identical. A niche means a, a special job or a special, um, I don't know, like a special job or fit for a species. So if they're, t if they're identical, um, competitive exclusion means if we both have the same wants or the same jobs, um, one of them will have to eventually die off. And then resource partitioning means differences in niches enable species to coexist. So I don't have a picture of it, or maybe I do later on, but think of like a tree where different birds um, have food at different heights of a tree. So at the top of a tree could be a different species, which is different than the lower part of the tree. So resource partitioning means um, different species can coexist because they know how to partition and share it. Um, amongst the different species. An ecological niche means the sum total of an organism's use of abiotic and biotic resources in the environment. I'm not too sure if you remember, but to make sure you guys understand abiotic, abiotic means non-living and biotic means living um, resources in the environment. A fundamental niche is the niche potentially occupied by the species and realized is the one that it actually occupies. So if you see, for example, in this picture, we have the Chthalmus and the Balonis. Um, these are um, different species that are existing on the shore. Um, so think of this as the realized niche for the Balonis and the realized niche for the Chthalmus. This is the realized niche. This is what they actually occupy. But fundamentally, the Chthalmus could occupy the whole thing. But this other species is kind of in the way it's taking over. So you should understand the difference between fundamental niche, like what they could technically take over and what they actually have or take over, actually occupies. So some, exa some examples of predation. So predation, again, is like a predator. Um, there are different adaptations to avoid predators or to hide from predators. Here, Some of these you already know, but they have fancy scientific names. 
For example, cryptic coloration, which is a fancy word for camouflage. So if you think of animals that are camouflaged, like a, um, even a chameleon, um, that's called cryptic coloration. There's aposematic or warning coloration, so that's the bright color of poisonous animals. So some of you that you know are afraid of spiders, I said that they hate spiders, those are ones with red dots on them or some sort of bright color that means it's poisonous, that's called warning coloration. Um, a Batesian mimicry means harmless species kind of mimic the color of harmful species, so there are species out there that aren't dangerous, but they copy like the bright color or they copy like um, like a snake, like the same colors as a snake does. Um, that's called Batesian mimicry. Mullerian mimicry means two bad tasting species resemble each other, so they have to be avoided. So um, if you remember that one example from the last standard or the last chapter about the eating of the monarch butterfly, um, the bad tasting species kind of resemble each other, so they just don't eat either of them. And then herbivory means um, these adaptations are for plants, so we're talking about chemical toxins, spines, thorns, they adapt. Um, even though these are plants and they can't really attack, they have you know, they have different adaptations so they survive. So think about like roses and thorns. So here's some examples of, um, of, of these adaptations we're talking about. Here's the cuckoo bee and the yellow jacket. Um, I think the cuckoo bee is the one that's not very, um, not very dangerous, but since it looks like a yellow jacket, it gets avoided. Here's an example of that cryptic coloration. You probably can't see it, but there's an animal that looks like a frog that's in there. Um, here's another example. Um, here's the hawk moth larva and the green parrot snake. You may notice that the heads are kind of the same. And here's an example of a frog, and not dangerous, but it has a, um, that coloration, that red, that makes others think that it's um, dangerous. Symbiosis, we talked about the three symbiosis already, and I said we'll mention it later. So there's parasitism, remember think parasite, positive, negative, good for one, and harming another. Mutualism, where they both survive. And commensalism, where one survives and the other one doesn't is bothered by it. So it's hard for you to see this one, but this is an example of a, a mutualistic, um, a mutualistic relationship. You could see these little tiny, they look like ants or these insects. They get, um, they get a place to live, but they also the what the plant gets, it gets protection because no one's going to eat this plant because it has these bugs on top of it. That's mutualism. They both benefit. And commensalism, I talked about. Um, I talked about this already, but like a bird that's on these um, water buffaloes, the bird gets a place to live and a place to stand, even gets traveling, like the, the, the water buffalo will take it places, but um, the buffalo isn't bothered at all. That's commensalism. You should know examples in your back pocket of each of these three. Okay, what about the structure of community? Um, the structure of community, they, uh, a one word that they use to define a community is called diversity, which some of you already know the name diversity. Diversity has a equation, just like math. Species richness, which means the number of different species, plus the relative abundance of each species. So for example, which of these is the most diverse? Say for example, A, B, C, and D are four different species. So what if 90% is A, 10% is B, we have 25% A, 25% B, 25% C, 25% D, and then 80A, 5B, 5C, and 10D. All right, which one's most diverse? I think you guys can figure it out on your own, or I think you all can figure it out on your own, but I'll explain why the answer is community two. Remember, we need species richness, right? This one only has two species. Well, two and three have, each have four. So that's why um, the answer cannot be community one. And then relative abundance, you'll notice that you have a lot of A and then barely any B, C, and D. But in this one, we have an equal amount of all four. That means there's a lot of relative abundance. So that's why the, the correct answer is community two. The Shannon Diversity Index is a number that they use to calculate the diversity based on species richness and abundance. And I'll, I'll teach you in class how to calculate the index. Um, the reason why you want to be diverse, why communities want to be diverse, is because they're more resistant to invasive species. I mean, some of you are wondering, what is an invasive species? And this is another thing you need to know in your back pocket. Invasive stands for invasion. So there are species that are outside of its native range, or there are species that came from a different country, a different location, and don't really belong um, in the location that we're analyzing. So for example, there's the kudzu, which is a vine plant from Japan. It has this noxious weed that kills trees and shrubs. So the kudzu is native of Japan. Somehow, some way, I don't know all the ex all the stories, but this particular one from Japan was brought to the United States, um, and it had a weed that eventually killed trees and shrubs like across um, that country. So that's the example of an invasive species.
Another one you can think of is the Dutch elm. The Dutch elm is a, a disease, and it was a fungus that was carried by beetles. Uh, what happened was it arrived in the United States on logs. So the Netherlands, from the Netherlands, we were importing logs, um, but on those logs, on those logs were um, a fungus that was carried by these beetles. What happens when they brought it over to the United States? Um, all these elm, all these elm trees, eventually died. Um, eventually, they tried to cultivate like elm trees that were immune to it and just kept growing more of it, but it didn't grow at a fast enough rate as they were dying. Another invasive species, uh, invasive species example. If you think about the potato blight, this is what caused the Irish potato famine. Those of you that studied world history in Ireland. Um, first of all, it arrived in Ireland from ships coming from the U.S. Only one species of potato planted in Ireland um, were only one species of planted in Ireland were. Um, anyways, all were susceptible to the disease. Okay, so they brought these potatoes. Um, and the potatoes, um, they carried like this fungus-like disease and it spread across all of them. One million people died. Um, and that's the problem with monoculture or lack of genetic diversity. So this actually happens to bananas as well, is that if you grow crops and they're all similar and one of them gets the disease, then all of them get the disease. That's why you want diversity in your community. So on to the next topic, um, trophic structures is something you need to know. Trophic is a fancy word for feeding. So the feeding, um, the trophic structure of a community is determined by the feeding relationships. When I say study trophic levels, I'm talking about, you know, the eating or feeding levels. Okay. Normally, the transfer of food is goes from plants to herbivores to carnivores back to decomposers and then into plants again. And that's called, you should know this, the food chain. So here's the example of some food chains where, you know, you have a plant which is eaten by an herbivore, which is eaten by a carnivore which is eaten by another carnivore, which is eaten by another carnivore. This is like an example of a terrestrial or one on land. Same thing happens in marine. We have phytoplankton, so we may have heard of plankton because of SpongeBob. They're eaten by zooplankton, which are eaten by carnivores fish, which are eaten by bigger fish, um, and then eventually eaten by, say, a killer whale. So that's why you should know why, or you should, that's why you should know what a, um, a food chain is for both um, terrestrial and in the marine. So why is a food chain like long or short? Like what limits the length of a food chain? There's two things. One, there should be there could be an inefficiency inefficiency of energy transfer, which means um, if there isn't enough energy being passed down. Um, one rule of thumb. I'm not too sure if we go over this in the next slide, but 10% only 10% of the energy travels up a food chain. So this plant has a lot of energy. It gets energy from the sun, and when the herbivore eats it, it only gets 10% of the energy. Um, part of it is not usable and part of it they use just to eat the food, so that's why they only retain 10%. Then this carnivore only gets 10% of that, and this gets 10% of that. So if there isn't, a, um, there isn't a lot of food or if there's inefficiency of energy, then the food chains are shorter. Long food chains are less stable than short chains. So if you think about it, a long food chain, say for example this one, is very dependent on the rest of the chains and its food, uh, rest of the links in its food chain. So for example, if all these die, this, these herbivores all of a sudden die, you lose all three of these. So short, short chains like this one um, are more stable or more likely to survive. If I put all these food chains together, they call that a food web, which is more is something more in line of what people actually study in real life. So here's an example of a marine food web, which starts with a fish, which can be eaten by birds and by seals, for example. Um, a food web has multiple layers to it, which is closer to reality. A given species may weave into the web at more than one trophic level. Um, in terms of species, there's different types of species that they're, they're key words that you should know them all. One's called dominant species. You should know a dominant species that has the highest biomass or is the most abundant. So the dominant species, you know, the one that has the most of. A keystone species, so a keystone, if I could explain an old story to you, a keystone, um, back in the day they used to have this arch um, in medieval times. And in the arch, they called that center top middle stone a keystone. Because if that stone were to break or if they remove that keystone, then the rest of the arch fell apart. That's why they call it a keystone species. These are species that if they removed it or they died off, then the rest of the food chain falls apart. So for example, a sea otter is a, um, a sea otter up here is considered a keystone species because they, if they died, that means there's more sea urchins and sea urchins eat kelp, which means if kelp is gone, then the whole 
the whole food chain is gone. So that's why a sea otter is a keystone species. Same thing with a grizzly bear. A grizzly bear eats salmon. And by eating salmon, it carries on the food chain on land because, you know, animals eat grizzly bears, um, et cetera, et cetera. But they transfer energy from the water to land. If they don't, if grizzly bears die, um, there's nothing else to transfer energy from the water to the land. And then there's also prairie dogs. Um, they burrow, they aerate the soil so that things can grow, and they also trim vegetation. So they're also a keystone species that if they die, then the rest of the food chain dies off. What can affect diversity? Um, something called a disturbance, which sounds very easy to understand. A disturbance changes a community by removing, removing organisms. So a disturbance is some sort of removal of the species or um, some resource is changed. So like there's a, there could be a fire or drought, flood, storm, or human activity like human killing or taking down, chopping trees or whatever. So these are the examples of availability. When there's a disturbance that starts off a um, starts off something called succession or ecological succession, which means it's a transition in species composition in a certain area over a certain amount of time. So a succession means um, the whole community uh, transitions into a new community. That's a succession. Primary succession, you know, primary means like first. Uh, means that plants and animals invade where soil has not yet formed. So primary succession, the very, 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 very first, we talked about ecological succession. Step one, or the primary, means plants and animals invade where soil hasn't formed. So it always means like there's colonization of a volcanic island, like Hawaii, where there's a glacier. That's called primary succession. Secondary is when an existing community is cleared by a disturbance that leaves soil intact. So think about an abandoned farm, or a forest fire where like everything is cleared, that means um, a disturbance like kind of destroyed everything, but the soil is still there, and we're we're gonna start over again. And the last thing I want you to know is something called biogeographic factors. Biogeographic factors means what are the factors that affect um, diversity? Okay, what makes one place more diverse than another? One could be latitude. Okay, latitude um, those that are by the equator or in the tropics have more diversity. So think rainforest, think the islands, think um, the most diverse places in the world are like in Brazil or where the rainforests are because that latitude um, or that part of the globe near, closer to the equator, because it's warmer, tends to have more diversity. And also area. So the larger a place is, the more diverse it's going to be. Again, if it's a small place, it's not going to be very diverse. Um, they also, another term you need to know is something called biogeographic islands. So these are natural labs for studying diversity. What I mean by, what I mean by this is that they use islands to help study diversity as well because we can't, it's hard to, you know, travel the globe and see every continent. So they look at islands and make predictions from those. Islands are not determined by latitude and area, but islands are influenced by size and distance. If there are large islands, that means there's more immigration inside the island and there's lower extinction. So large is good for diversity. And then um, distance, I mean, we're talking about distance from the mainland. The farther it is from a mainland, immigration falls and extinction rates increase. So you want to be close to the mainland as well. So the two things that you want for islands is that you want them to be large and close to um, some sort of mainland. So that is the chapter on um, community ecology or communities in general. If you have any questions, you're going to put it down in the um, in this quiz. And also, you feel free to ask me or Mr. Shu in class if there's something that you don't understand. So thank you very much for watching, and I'll see y'all when I see y'all.